go. It's unmuted me now. See, the computer likes to keep me guessing. Uh, my name's Jesse, everybody. Welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast with us here. And for those who are joining us for the first time, and I know we do have a lot of new faces in the crowd today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. We do about 40, 50 broadcasts every single month all of which are on our YouTube channels. If you want to hear stories of exploration and science from across the globe, check that out when you're done the broadcast. Now, today's special for a number of reasons. Number one, it is the second last program of our incredible February, and February is classically our entire month dedicated solely to incredible women in science and exploration. I think we've done 50 broadcasts this month from 20 countries. It's been a really incredible celebration, and I want to thank all you classes, and especially to all the girls that have been so keen to ask questions and learn from some of the most amazing women on this planet. So thank you very much. It's always a really great time every single February since we started this in 2015. Now, secondly, we are back with one of my favorite group of speakers ever. I don't get to host them very often, so it's a real pleasure for me to get the, to join you again, and for especially our new classes today. We are joined by Hilda and Sinova from Heart in the Ice. We've been working with them for, I think, three, four years now, featuring some of the amazing stories from their time at the remote trapper's cabin, Bumsavu, in Svalbard in Norway. Uh, you can check out, again, all of the broadcasts we've done with them at our Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants page, but we've dove in recently on a big series of programs sort of partnering between them and Polar Bears International, another organization we love to feature here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And today's particularly special because we're unveiling a new video. It is International Day polar bears. So lots to discover. And I'm so excited to welcome back Hilda and Sinova to take us away and showcase a bit of their story. And we'll dive in with the video. we got a lot to cover today. So uh, ladies, welcome back to the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, happy International Polar Bear Day. Happy International Polar Bear Day. We're so excited to be here. And you, where did you come from? So I came from uh, the Norwegian Arctic, where we, where the film that we are about to show you are filmed. And we had access to this hut way out in the wilderness of Svalbard. And I, I can tell you guys that up there now, it's supposed to be the coldest month of, of, uh, of the year. It's February. And we still don't have any sea ice, which is, which is uh, serious for the polar bears and for all of us. And I, um, you all know that I live in Canada. So hello to all the fellow Canadians. I'm on Vancouver Island. And I flew out here. We're actually both um, right now in downtown Montreal at the Canada Goose Store in an office full of a lot of mannequins and boxes. It's quite funny, actually. And um, we are here uh, for a couple of different reasons to celebrate International Polar Bear Day. But we were at a big fundraiser um, on Saturday in support of Polar Bears uh, International and Canada Goose. So um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time doing more of an intro We'd like to kick off the film Violet. And I do just want to share that we got a message this morning from Joss Stone. And some of you may wonder, well, what does Joss Stone have to do with Violet? Quite a bit. You want to share how that came to be? Yeah. So uh, Joss were on our send off back in 2019 when we left uh, the civilization to be immersed by nature for what we thought was going to be nine months that ended up to be 19 months due to COVID. So Joss was uh, on board. And uh, just uh, shorter than a year after, she got a girl uh, called, uh, she called her Violet. So it was just uh, su such a fun thing for us to call this polar bear Violet. And it's also resonate with the colors that we love up in the Arctic. It's purple and pink and violet. And so it fits well. So the name of our film uh, was inspired by her daughter, right? Oh, how nice. So here it well, is. This is the first time uh, anybody is seeing it right now. How exciting. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to cue that up. Let's dive in, everybody, and we'll come back right after. Mother polar bears have one of the most incredible life stories on Earth to live and raise their families in this harsh Arctic environment. Long-term data is critical to better understanding a species and what it's going through. For polar bears, the only reason we know that they're being impacted by climate change to the extent that they are is because we have amazing long-term data sets showing what's happening to their populations. COVID-19 made it so that researchers could not get to Svalbard during the pandemic. This resulted in a loss of data collection for that year, giving us these big gaps in our data set. 
Hilda and Sunova were already in the field. Though the researchers couldn't get there, they could rely on hearts in the ice to fill some gaps with the observations they were seeing. I am so excited because Hilda and I are on the same ship that dropped us off three years ago to Bumsabu to start our overwintering. Bumsabu and our location for 19 months was like going into outer space. We were completely isolated. It was a very big risk to be there, but it was worth it. We're frozen. Ever since I came to Svalbard, I wanted to be part of this nature, the wildlife, changes in the seasons and the light. Everything is painted in blue and purple and pink and red. It's just absolutely amazing. Both of us are adventurers and we've had a lot of, we've done a lot of things in our life. But uh, I met Hilda in, in 2016. I was working for a polar operator and, and so was she. Then we discovered our shared passionate love of the polar regions. The spark between us like soul sister immediately. I saw the opportunity that she might be able to fulfill my dream to do an overwind training in the Arctic. After we met, just having dialogue and talking about, well, what can we use this hut, Bumsabu, which means little bear hut, what could we use this for? Sunni Van Hilden reached out to several scientists at the Polar Institute and asked, are there things we can do when we are here? So I said that one of the bears that is very important and interesting to us is 26131 because she's one of the best Spitsbergen bears we have. And this is one of the areas in Svalbard where we have seen the largest changes in sea ice conditions. So it's very interesting for us to see how those bears are doing. Svalbard is in the Barents Sea and is a unique polar bear habitat. It's very mountainous with these cliffs precipitously dropping into the sea. There's fjords and glaciers and snow, and overall it's quite a rugged terrain. In particular, the southwest corner of Svalbard is warmer than anywhere else in the Arctic. Polar bears are already spending more time on land than they did 20 to 30 years ago, and the ice-free period is increasing by about 40 days per decade. This means that their key hunting period of the year for finding seals is getting shorter. So Ewan Orsh knew it was a polar bear that he had been following for many years in our area and he asked us could we go and see if she had a cub or not well it felt like getting a piece of you know secret information i can't get there uh we know where she is and we want you to tell us if you see her and what you find we were up on ridges down to the fjord ice and and, and then we came to the area where we were supposed to see her. And there she was with the cup, a healthy little cup. The heart just starts, starts to beat because it's so exciting to see her with the cub in her environment. It was both a big excitement, but also a little tenderness and, and sadness. Would this cub survive? In Svalbard, Polar Bears International has been working on a maternal denning project for many years, along with the Norwegian Polar Institute. This project involves finding known den locations from collared female polar bears and putting in remote camera systems quietly. In this way, we're not disturbing polar bear families, but we're able to capture footage of them when they emerge from their dens, getting critical information on the mom's body condition, the body condition of her cubs, and how many cubs she has. Jon Orsch has, has given this particular polar bear the number N26131. After our first encounter with her, she became our bear. And so we, we sat at Bumsabu and we tossed around a couple of ideas for names. And uh, we decided to call her Violet.
In July, we saw a female get out of the water right here, went over the little knoll here, and then rolled. And we weren't sure if it was actually Violet because she was without cub. And we call Yulnosh and he can, can tell us that it is Violet. So it died in between late April and my birthday, July 13th. When we saw Violet the first time with her cub, it was a, an incredible experience. And you just assume that you're gonna see her again with her cub. And so when we saw her without, it was very sad. And so a lot of questions came up, like what happened? How did it die? Typically a female here in Svalbard give birth first time when she's six years old. Uh, they have high survival until they're 15 and they give birth on average every second year. If the cubs survive, it's each third year, not more frequent. So it means they lose a lot of the litters. So maybe if they have like five litters, 10 cubs, maybe two cubs make it to adult. Many factors influence cub survival. A main factor is the health of the mother. She needs to be healthy enough and have enough body fat to adequately sustain and nurse her cubs. If it's getting too difficult for her, there's a chance she could abandon them. Also, simply navigating the shifting sea ice conditions is hard. Ice is moving more than ever and there's more open water than there used to be. In some ways, this is reducing access to seals, but also increasing swimming in some regions. And for polar bear cubs, swimming can be really difficult. Winter number two was a much milder winter than the first winter. We had less sea ice, the formation of sea ice was later, and we had less snow. We were really worried about Violet. Would she able to find a spot to dig a den? And that was the big question. When April was here and she was coming out of the den, did she give birth to a cub? So we were given GPS coordinates from Jon because again, he couldn't get out in the field. And that was our little mystery to go and find out if we could locate her. It was a longer trip this time. We were searching the area. And of course, first and foremost, we were looking for tracks. And so we searched up and down and over and up and down and over and then finally get to the top of this one knoll, park the snowmobile, and Hilda was looking off in one direction, and then I looked down and I saw these tracks and skid marks from clearly cub, cub or cubs. And that was, she's either been here or she's here. And we went back to the snowmobile and drove around, and there she was with two healthy cubs and we could see how much they had been playing there, they had been eating there. It was just a great feeling to see that she actually still managed to give birth to two healthy cubs. We were complete visitors to their, their domain, their world, their Arctic. It was, a, it was amazing. It was our last encounter, it was as if she said goodbye. I've been all over this island. I've been exploring it. And now I most of all want to protect it. You feel very attached to the stories of these bears because they have a history with the researchers. It was a real privilege for us actually to be invited into the world of the scientists to understand why this matters. We only get a glimpse into the lives of polar bears, but there is so much left to learn. The decisions we make today directly impact polar bear moms and their cubs who are trying to survive in a warming Arctic. But those decisions also impact our children and our children's children. We all have a part to play in this climate challenge. And by working together, we know protecting a future for polar bears means a better world for us all.
Outstanding. Uh, Hilda, son of a, I'm going to invite you back in in a minute. I do want to note that this video is just like 40 minutes ago put out on YouTube in advance of today's program. So if you want to check out it out again, share it with friends and family outside of the bounds of this Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program, you can do so at that link. And I'll share that in the StreamYard chat and the YouTube chat for absolutely everyone. What a moving piece. And, and so cool uh, getting to feature uh, Jan, Alisa, all these people that we've had on in the broadcast in partnership with you. Uh, the Polar Bears International team is a really special group of scientists and, and people. Um, and so I'm so curious as someone who's had the chance to be involved in these broadcasts with you over the last few years, uh, I didn't know about this film coming to fruition. How did it come to be that this was even made? It's such a, it's, it's so well done. <laughs> Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think uh, without knowing it, Sunova and I prepared for this uh, expedition since we were your age. Uh, everyone out in the in the classrooms around the world looking at this. So, and we had access to this hot Bamsebu, and we were at the right place at the right right time because COVID happened, and we were citizen scientists, and we already knew Jon Ors in Norwegian Polar Institute, and we also knew. Uh, the gang from Polar Bear International, and we just we were just there, and he could not come due to COVID. He could not go into the field, so we were there. He needed the information about a polar bear that he had been following for so many years already. So it was very important for him to know whether she had cubs or not. So I guess we just um, as citizen scientists, for us it was a fantastic opportunity to make such a an important contribution to to the science. And Jesse, you you said this um, you said this earlier, but way back when, when we were at Bumsabu, yeah. one of our first calls about polar bears was with exploring by the seat of your pants. Yeah. And I remember um, we reached out to Polar Bears International, and we had um, we had uh, BJ on the call, and then we had Johanna from the from NPI, and BJ is up in Svalbard right now. And it's so interesting how this film came to be. Um, the backstory that Hilda just shared is sort of, it's that's the backstory. And then the moving forward from there, it was really about slowly us getting to know the gang from Polar Bear International, them getting to know us, them understanding that we had a lot of really cool footage um, that you see in the film um, and that we had a story that, um, you know, lucky for us, could be told in collaboration with both Polar Bear International and Canada Goose because, you know, Hearts in the Ice is a platform, right, for inspiration and engagement. Polar Bear International is the is the largest nonprofit organization in the world dedicated solely to polar bear research and education. And Canada Goose, as we know it, um, yes, they sell lots of clothing and they're trying to keep the the planet cold and the people warm, but they're doing a lot of great stuff around sustainability. So with the three of us working together to make this film, we're just sharing a much bigger way to get the message out that the polar bears need our help. They sure do. And it's been so heartening seeing the uptake from classrooms as we've done these broadcasts with you. There's no animal on this planet. Like we can do tigers, we can do elephants, nothing captures classrooms attention like polar bears and there's a reason why they're an icon of conservation they're this canary in a coal mine for a changing planet uh, and your work has done such an amazing job in, in highlighting their plight and then what we can do to help protect them and, and i think that video is a, a natural and wonderful extension of that so thank you so much for that um today you're in montreal which is one of the best cities in the world and has the best sandwiches on this planet bar none <laughs> Um, if, you, if you need something to do, I can recommend things later. But I understand you were uh, in Toronto, uh, and specifically at the Toronto Zoo, who, by the way, the biggest broadcast we've ever done in our history at Toronto Zoo. We've been working with them for several years now. Again, all those are on our YouTube channel. So what brought you to the Toronto Zoo? Uh, and did you get the well, chance to meet with, with yeah. and the good yeah. people there? <laughs> yeah, we were so lucky. We were together with Polar Bear International and had sort of a uh, backstage opportunity to uh, go in there and see how they were working with the animals that are usually out in the wilderness and i'm sure all of you guys that are on the phone now uh, phone call now you have been in a zoo uh, i haven't been in a zoo for many many years but i've seen polar bears in the wild we saw more than 100 polar bear we had more than 100 polar bear encounters at bamsabu during our stay but just uh, being able to to see how they work with the animals how they take care of them how they use that platform as a 
um, as an information platform to to share how they live out in the wilderness, how how they need to, uh, what kind of conditions they need, how important it is to, for us to protect them. It's an it was an amazing experience, and they are so skilled and so knowledgeable, and they share great information about the wildlife and why it's so important for all of us to pre- protect them. Mm-hmm. Not only the polar bears, but the sea ice is not just important for the polar bears it's so important for the ocean for the for the wildlife and in the the whole food web in the ocean and for all of us living species you know it was kind of emotional uh to be there well i guess i'm just an emotional kind of gal (laughs) no i'm kidding about you know it's good i always say when i don't have emotions that's not a good day um you know uh it is a really interesting thing to see a polar bear in captivity i'll be completely transparent about that. But to get a behind the scenes with Alyssa uh, and the team at the Toronto Zoo, you get a better understanding of what they're doing with them in captivity. And it it's really impressive. I'm, I, I, don't, I took a, an image of this, but I don't know if you can see it, um, but it is sort of, it's, it's like a chart that they have of the, the five polar bears that they have there. And one of their main objectives is to really make sure the habitat is supporting the um, the thriving of the polar bear. And they will not have, uh, in the future, all of their exhibits with their wildlife that they have there will have that, a much stronger component of that. So it's very impressive. And it's right. even more impre- impressive to see how PBI is, um, you know, infused with the outreach angle and, and the scientific research. So, and, yeah. you know, of course, Aww. we had to get one of these guys. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, pull, pull my arm as I'm leaving the, the plate to go through the, the visitor center. Um, yeah. Well, I, I'm so glad you had such a wonderful opportunity. And this yeah. is something that comes up a lot in our programs, especially when we do zoo programs, is this idea of wildlife versus a, a place where people have the chance to interact with it. And I'm like you, I'm lucky enough to have been to Churchill, seen polar bears in the wild. My closest, most amazing polar bear interaction came at the Toronto Zoo, where it's right there and you get the chance to, to see it and to learn from the people that are taking care of it. And so one note on this to follow up with, I, I'd encourage our audience to check out torontozoo.com. The work that they do as a conservation hub is really incredible and zoos around the world generally have started to fill this role. But particularly if you're wondering about the quality of animal care, if you're wondering about the backdrop of a zoo, look for AZA or CAZA accreditation when you go to a zoo. And that means that it's one of the zoos that has the highest standard of animal mm. care, that protects the wildlife, that works for conservation, uh, and you can be assured of that. Like it's like the, the highest level certification you can get in the world for a place like the Toronto Zoo. So <laughs> as a nice follow up to that, and uh, I'm so glad you ladies had that great experience and the great polar bear stuffy too. It's a beautiful, beautiful bit bigger. <laughs> um, so Hilda, are, are you uh, good if we dive in with questions now? We've got a bunch of live classes with us. We've already had a bevy coming in on YouTube, uh, but is there anything else you'd like to share before we dive in with our Q&A with our friends today? Sorry, Joe, what did we, you, oh, we lost you. Oh, you lost me, that's no good. Yeah. Back now, better? We're back, you're good. back. I was just I was just saying, is there anything else you'd like to share uh, before we dive in with Q&A? We've got a bunch of questions already coming in on YouTube. We've got our seven, eight classes with us live. But is there any last message before I start with uh, our groups on camera? Just a really quick and then let's go into questions. You know, the reason we're doing what we're doing is because we want to inspire greater service to the earth and care for not just each other as humans, but also wildlife. So all of you on the call, find out, you know, what your passionate interest is and just just go for it. And we can't wait to hear all the questions. Fantastic. Well, we will um, go to Miss Foley's class in just a second in Massachusetts, but I'll take one from YouTube to kick us off. Um, let's see. Oh, Miss Ward's class wants to know if polar bear cubs are born with fur or if they're little hairless little bear cubs. <laughs> yeah, wow. They are, they're half a kilo and they are with, without fur. So that was why we were so worried about Violet, uh, the second winter at Bamsebu. We knew it was very little snow, and Yul Norsh in Norwegian Polar Institute could actually tell us that she was struggling inside her little den. The den was so thin of, of snow, so she was cold in there. And imagine this, imagine this, little, this little hair uh, without any fur, polar bear cub that are struggling enough uh, to get the food uh, from his mom and then having a cold then. But she she actually managed to 
to get them out of the den uh, alive, but uh, sadly they they died. But yes, they're born without fur. And uh, half a kilo, my favorite analogy for this, Elisa actually says it. She says they're about the size of a stick of butter. So that's <laughs> how you think of polar bear, which is a, a great thought. Um, I lied. I'm going to go to Miss Stouffer's class first because I know you guys need to go in Lakanto. So welcome in in Florida third graders. If you have a question for us, call in. Miss Stouffer's class. Uh, what's your coldest degrees that you've ever been? In? Hmm, what about you? Um, well, I think I've experienced close to 50 minus, but during our stay at Bamsebu on this particular hut that was uninsulated and very old, we had uh, wind chills down to yeah, maybe 60. We had 34 minus degrees and a lot of wind. So that was very cold, even inside. It was very cold inside the huts. And, and my coldest is actually uh, was a long time ago, um, dating myself here. It was when I was standing at the South Pole on January 14th um, with the first team of women. And it was minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. And that was, uh, was really hard to breathe. Yes. I was going to say, I mean, these are pretty superlative cold temperatures. Some of our Canadians will like have at least experience like minus 40 and stuff. The kids in Florida have no idea what we're talking about at all. <laughs> um, great question, guys. Uh, Miss Foley's class, we'll go to Northborough. If you want to come on in, you're good to go. Hey. 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 Is there a reason why you wanted to choose polar bears to help? Yeah. All the creatures. Oh. Why polar bears? What was the question? Is there a reason why we chose to help polar bears? Uh, you, you know, I'll just take a quick step. You know, um, polar bears, is, as we know, represent sort of like they are the icon of the Arctic. And as we know, um, what's going on in the Arctic is going to affect the rest of the world. So we feel that, and, and you know, um, Jesse said it earlier, of all the shows that exploring by the seat of your pants hosts polar bears get a lot of attention so um it is kind of interesting to use to use the polar bear as an image for changes happening around the world so um the story starts with the polar bear but it doesn't end there and so um we're fortunate to have had as many encounters as we have and to work with um you know two different entities that are really trying to share outreach on what's happening with the sea ice and the change in biodiversity of our species and climate change so it's um for us it's a it's, it's a natural fit fantastic i'm gonna head to our, our friend miss darcy's class in south jordan and utah now their mic wasn't working earlier but i will check to see if it is working by fluke fourth graders I don't think so. No, but you did share in the chat, which is great. So I'll just say a quick hi. Uh, welcome in, guys. So they want to know, are polar bears born hungry? Uh, are they Are they just good? They come out and they can take a rest for a week, or do they want milk immediately? <laughs> if they're born hungry? Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. sure they are. I mean, they have uh, a couple of, or three months maybe inside a den to grow fur and to, um, I think they are around seven, five, seven up to 10 kilos maybe when they come out of the den so they have a short uh a limited time to to eat as much as they can from their uh, the ri very rich milk from their mom so i'm sure they are starving when they're when they are born pretty right. much all of us are born hungry it's 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 a, it's a tough time in there you want to get out and start eating immediately right <laughs> We've got a lot of young classes today, but we do have a class of grade 11. So I want to come to them to ask a question that will inevitably stump us all. Uh, Miss Hunter's environmental crew, uh, grade 11, did you want to come on up? Am I on there? Oh, hi. Everyone's being really shy. So mm -hmm. I'm going to be the voice of their questions. Um, my class is really curious about that, you know, living in the Arctic and doing research in the Arctic. How on earth did you, you know, get to do that? Um, and also what kinds of sacrifices did you have to leave behind? Cause those living conditions in that little shack looked start. horrendous. Like that looked, like, you know, that would be hard living. How did you do it? How did you survive? Great question. I'll tackle the first part of your question and thank you very much. And hello to all the 11th graders. You need to not be shy. <laughs> um, <right. laughs> and then we'll take the second part. 
you know, we have both worked and still do in the expedition uh, cruise industry. And we were both working with polar operators that use citizen science as a way to engage guests and uh, to become stewards of the Arctic or the Antarctic. And so we had a couple of connections. Jon Orsch was one of the connections that Hilda had from prior. And uh, we had multiple connections and collecting phytoplankton and sea ice and doing aurora time lapse um, and cloud observation. And we literally just picked up the phone and said, you know what, we are going to be in one spot for nine months. Is there anything we can collect for you? Because scientists are struggling with collecting data for a long time. They usually can fly into these remote regions for maybe a week or two. Uh, we're going to be there for nine months. And so they were so excited about um, us being able to collect a, a long a term data set for them. And that's how the whole science piece started. And uh, initially, they were not sure that we could actually follow all the protocol because we're not scientists. But then we became uh, very trustworthy and we proved to them uh, through a lot, a lot of hard work mm -hmm. in cold conditions that we could actually follow to the T what they needed and what they would have done and then deliver the samples to them uh, in a way that they needed them. So uh, over time, we, we, we just became credible citizen scientists over those 19 months. And, and just short about the living conditions. So I have been living up in Svalbard for 28 years now. So, and I had access to this uh, hut from Cebu. Um, so um, having this hut and, and being able to use that as a platform as citizen scientists and storytellers and uh, just um, telling everyone out there how how we were experienced and being eyewitnesses to the changes and to the wildlife that we, that we really want to protect was uh, was a great opportunity for us but will they find this hut on airbnb absolutely not <laughs> why <laughs> it's a private owned uh, hut and it's protected it's a was, cultural heritage and there's no running water and no insulation just that, fyi and no color <laughs> So beautiful, yes. I, I'm on. I'm on route right now. Uh, thank you for that, uh, and and thank you for uh, Ms. Hunter for sharing that question on behalf of the class. I want to just pass this along from YouTube, just uh, and I think it's on behalf of everyone who's joining in. Just to, you know, oh, Marby. So thank you, Happy. Um, <laughs> I'm going to head to uh, Ms. Campbell's group. Uh, we'll head there first, and then we'll take a few from YouTube. We've got our Holy Family School, Miss Clark. We've got so many classes. Oh, oh it's overwhelming. Uh, but Campbell's class, come on in. Unmute your mic, and you're good to go. Hey. Hi. Hi. Uh, why do polar bear, polar bear cubs die so easily? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I wish we had Alyssa here, but uh, I can try to answer that. It's uh, several reasons. I think one of the, the biggest reasons is the sea ice, as we're talking about. So sea ice is important for the polar bear in order to hunt seals. And the sea ice also are important for the seals and everything that happens underneath uh, the, the sea ice. But anyway, uh, polar bears die out of starvation, and they also die... Um, uh, because of the warmer temperature, they have less access to food. Uh, they are now trying to hunt reindeers up in Svalbard. But, um, and also, um, even f f uh, male polar bears are um, kind of predators to their own uh, cubs in order to mate again. So it's, it's several, several challenges. But the warmer temperature and lack of sea ice is one of the biggest challenges for the polar bears. I'll just, I just want to give them a little visual, if I may, because I, I don't know if it was Alyssa who shared this, is imagine that the polar bears, as Hilda just shared, they need the sea ice, right? They need to find the seals, um, hunt the seals on the sea ice, and then and then feed on that seal, and then, um, and then they feed their cub. And if the sea ice is shifting, which it is a lot, it's breaking up, this, the polar bears have to jump from ice flow to ice flow, and often the little cub um, maybe can't jump to that ice flow and it falls in the water and they're challenged because they're not, they don't have enough fat on them yet to actually handle swimming long distances. Um, and so they're exposed at greater, for greater lengths of time. And then there's, as he said, the starvation piece. So it's just a lot of challenges, a yeah. lot of challenges. 
And I, I want to note for on behalf of kids, I remember being a kid and learning about animals and, and babies not making it. And it's really sort of a, a shocking thing to think about. People are really quite unique in that most of the, you know, most children survive. Most animals in the world, a lot of their babies won't make it. And so it's sort of just the, the way of things. What we're trying to do is avoid a situation where more babies are dying, where the population is in trouble because of that. Um, and that's sort of the, one of the essences of this film and this idea. But it's pretty common, sort of as sad as it seems, that uh, a lot of baby animals don't survive their first couple of years. But I'm yeah. really glad we got that question. And thank you for being so candid in the answer. Um, you also answered Ms. Dahl's question, which is, what's the role of male polar bears after the cubs are born? So they're just, they're a predatory influence at this point. They're not taking care yes. of babies anyway. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, not the best. Avoid the male polar bears and you've got your cup with you. Um, we're going to take uh, one more from YouTube and then I'm going to go to the Holy Family School. Miss Clark, if you want to unmute your mic, we'll do an audio question and then that might be it. Time flies and you're having fun in these broadcasts, folks. Uh, Miss Poff's class, our, our virtual JK, SK, one class in Ontario, what they want to know, is it true that polar bears have black skin? Yes, it is true that they have black skin. Uh, the, the, and they seem to be white, but, yep. the, but the fur is hollow uh, and almost like glass uh, hollow. And, uh, and that is to reflect the sun and the heat, of course. And it, it's also the most insulated fur in the world is the polar bear uh, fur. So, but yes, they, have, they do have black skin. I'm so glad you mentioned the fur thing because we did that with Elisa the other day and it always it's so counterintuitive like polar bears aren't really white they're like clear fur and it's so odd because of course when we look at them they appear white but if you actually have polar bear fur in your hand it's not it doesn't look like it's a dye it's not like a white sweater um so yeah I am glad we we got all this stuff this is great holy family school I'm gonna head to you guys this friend this class if you want to come on in you're good to go hey hey Hi. 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 Step down and ask your question. What's the oldest polar bear that you guys know of? Ooh. Ooh. That we follow? That we follow. Well, I, I think uh, the oldest polar bear they have found on Svalbard is 32 years old. But we, Sunova and I, ha had a very close encounter. That's not very uh, common, I think. I think around 20. 25 maybe is is a, a very old polar bear we had a, a polar bear at our doorstep uh, the last week we were there and that was probably the biggest one that we had that close uh, he was 550 kilos and 21 years old and the reason why we could actually tell was he had a number on his on his back because he had been uh, um uh researched on uh, and he we called you Nosh and he could tell us this wh what kind of polar bear it was 550 kilos and and at 21 years old That's and it. it's interesting the females have a collar and the males are sprayed with a number on their on their backside and have tags in their ears do tell what why is that i'm so curious <laughs> Well, I think what they're trying to discover is, you know, what is the reproductive rate of the female polar bears? Uh, if you follow them, you can follow the species. Um, it's a little bit more difficult for a male. They are tagging. They are tagging the males and with a number. Um, but there's a lot more they can gain from females in a den with their with their baby cubs. So yeah. that's telling a much more a fuller story of polar bear survival. And also one more thing. The female has a little bit head nothing nothing like this but the the male has a very uh the male has a neck that goes a little like this so it's yeah. much easier to to mount uh, a collar around the neck of a polar bear mom and she yeah. can actually it's it's taken around her neck like this so yeah. if she doesn't want it she can just take it off uh, half of them do that yeah We've, um, uh, you've had these incredible experiences in the cabin with a bear at the door, which is something that most people would never want to experience. And I'm sure you yeah. a little nervous, but very excited at the same time. We've had uh, Lisa on one of her first programs ever. She was in a helicopter where they're darting the polar bear and they land the helicopter and they put the collar on. I mean, again, for students that are keen to become a biologist, it's like, can be one of the coolest jobs in the whole world ever. Oh, I was flying in my helicopter. We darted the polar bear. We went down and put a collar on it. Now we can do it for science. So. Well, it's funny you say that, Jesse, because this morning, Hill and I, when we watched the, the um, Violet for the first time and saw them with pulling the sleds, you know, going out to set up their uh, 
their denning equipment we're like we want their job and we and then <laughs> it's like, we, want, we have we their that. job <laughs> we have their job you're we're, we're, so we're like, all jealous of you that's why you're the speakers in this and i just get to be the everybody out there should be inspired you know by science and stay in school and 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 understand that there's so many opportunities today with technology to get into different aspects of science and conservation. Yeah. You get to work with some of the coolest people in the world. You get to uh, like present, you. you get to travel. Yeah, you get to, uh, I mean, just you get to do something that you love to do every day for the rest of your life. And that's a and very rare situation in the world. So, And I'm, protect I'm, something that is really important for all of us, not only the polar bears, but for all of us. Polar Bears International. If people want to learn more about that and check it out the website at the end. And of course, heartsintheice.com too. Uh, ladies, we've got time for one more question. Uh, so Miss Clark's class three fours. I know your camera isn't on, but if you want to unmute your mic, you should be good to go. If you'd like to do that, we can bring you in and see. And if not, the note is not going. Okay, that's fine. We'll head back to Miss Dursey. Um, oh, they're, they don't have a mic either. We got all these classes without any mics. I'm going to take one from YouTube and we'll wrap up from there and highlight with one final message. So, uh, Ms. Amu's class joining in Vancouver. Do you name the Cubs? Is there pro like, do, do people ever name the Cubs or no? And yeah. Uh, for, what about, um, yeah. So we have, we have polar bears, uh, up in Svalbard that we have, a uh, have names on. Um, they are debating whether that's, a, that's a good thing or not. Um, uh, we we named Violet because she was around us uh, for m almost two years, at least two winters. So uh, for us, it it, it was uh, kind of natural not having to call her N two six one three one. So uh, yeah, I always like when we get the name question. So Jane Goodall was really like the first scientist to ever do this in a serious way. Before that, scientific naming with animals was always a big string of numbers and letters. And I think personifying them in that way lets people connect with them more. Mm -hmm. the, the video, that, as beautiful as that video was, if it's not called Violet, if it's called the string of numbers and letters, does it have the same impact? Probably not. People Probably. connect with names, they connect with that idea of an individual, and you, you really get that. So I'm glad we got that question. Yeah, yeah. good question. Yeah. It's, Hilda. it's just so much fun for me every single time. Honestly, I'm just as big a, a fan as I am the professional host guy. Um, but I will note again, if people want to check out heartsintheice.com, I'm going to share this with all our registered classes today. We had a class that's registered all over North America and the world, so please do check out your email when you're done. Polar Bears International for more on them. And I'll link in Toronto Zoo, because we got a nice plug-in for mm -hmm. them as well today. And of course, if you want to check out the Violet movie again, it's on this YouTube link. That will be in your inbox, I promise, very soon. But before we wrap up and bring all our classes in for a big thank you and farewell, as we always like to do, is there a final message you want to share with us about your work, about the video, anything to leave off the broadcast with? You start us off? I'll kick us off, I guess. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there's no silver bullet answer for all the challenges we're facing, eh? Um, but one thing is clear in the work that we've been doing since coming back from Bumsboo, and that is, um, you know, these platforms with, with you, Jesse, exploring by the seat of your pants are so important um, as ways to bring in people like us and, and our partnerships with PBI and Canada Goose into the classroom. But if there's something I want to encourage everybody to do, um, it, get outside you know, really rub up uh, against um, the cold wind and our natural world and, and feel your own power to actually engage in an active and uh, heart-centered way to solve a problem because there are a lot of different things that are challenging out there today, including how we treat one another. So I would say um, just be kind um, to yourselves, to each other, and to to all the precious species around there because every single thing um, needs a little bit of extra love. Yeah, well said, Sunova. And uh, I mean, we have so much more power than we think we have. Individuals, uh, collecti collectively, we will be able to move the needle. We can make the difference that we need to see. Yep, those are they're hard to Violet, than that. Oh, sorry. Violet is still alive. Yep. We, I'm glad we, you asked that. We got that question on YouTube that I was going to share. So, yes, Violet's still Absolutely. alive, still going strong. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And she is in a, in a den still. She will be out of a den within uh, maybe a, a short month. Wow. So, hopefully, she comes out with two new cubs, crossing well, fingers. We're, we're going to have to do another broadcast then and hear all about it. So, I, I can't wait till then. 
Yeah. And that's no. Joss Stone's Violet. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> oh, ladies, thank you so much for this, um, uh, for such a great broadcast. Canada Goose, Polar Bears International, Hearts in the Ice, uh, as a team effort, this was a really incredible program today. Uh, as you both know, what we do to end every broadcast, and for our newbies, if it's your first time, I'm going to bring in all our class to say a big thank yes. you and farewell. So Miss Darcy's group, Miss Hunter's grade 11s, Campbell's class, uh, Holy Family School, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone.